Hello, I'm Marcus Louth and welcome to the latest edition of the UFO Insight Podcast, where we examine all things UFOs and aliens, conspiracies and mysteries, and all aspects of the paranormal. Okay, today we will examine some of the apparent UFO hotspots around the world, certain locations for unknown reasons that appear to have many more UFO sightings than others. And there are more of these hotspots than we might at first think, and what's more, they can literally be found right around the world. Okay, we will start by examining a location that stretches from top to bottom of the United Kingdom, a region known as UFO Alley. This location stretches down to Wiltshire in the south of England to the Bonnie Bridge area of Scotland. Indeed, each of these locations has several intriguing encounters to their respective names. In Wiltshire, for example, UFO sightings in the region began to increase from the early 1950s onwards. Many would report disc shapes or bright lights overhead. As the 1960s progressed, sightings would begin to increase dramatically. In December 1964, residents began to notice a crackling or humming sound. At the same time, an entire flock of pigeons simply fell to the ground, as if they had struck something unseen in the air. Sightings would explode over the following years, becoming known as the Warminster Thing. These would continue in regularity until the mid-1970s. Despite another spike in 1978, they would begin to decrease somewhat, although not entirely. UFO researcher Arthur Shuttlewood would write about the sightings extensively, both for Warminster and Wiltshire newspapers and in his book The Warminster Mystery. He would face the usual ridicule and mocking for his claims. He would remain, however, steadfast in his belief that something was happening in the area. Shuttlewood certainly wasn't the only person to experience strange sightings during this time. A sighting witnessed by UFO researcher Kevin Goodman in early 1977 is of particular interest, not least due to its location near the military installation. As he was looking in the direction of Cradle Hill, four red lights, evenly spaced out, came into view. The lights stopped over Battlesbury Barracks, where they hung silently for a moment. Suddenly, one of the lights would shoot directly upwards into the sky at great speed. A moment later, the other three lights followed in the same manner. Meanwhile, if we cross the border from England to Scotland and to Bonnie Bridge, we find multiple equally intriguing encounters. While the peak of the activity in this region of Scotland occurred between 1992 and 1996 during the Falkirk Triangle Wave, which we'll look at in a future podcast episode, activity, sporadic as it might be, goes back decades, and they similarly continue today. Perhaps one of the strangest incidents occurred slightly to the west of Bonnybridge in Glasgow, known as the Flaming Train Incident. Just before Christmas in December 1983, Tom Coventry stood at a bus stop. After several moments of waiting, his evening would take a most bizarre turn. Out of the blue, and at extremely low altitude, a grey silver object, shaped like a railway carriage, screeched towards the bus stop. With flames shooting and licking out from the end of the craft, it hovered no more than 20 feet away from him. He could clearly see three windows and what appeared to be swirling yellow smoke inside. Then, as suddenly as it had arrived, it would disappear up into the sky at great speed. While certainly not as active as it once was, sightings of strange happenings continue in the region today, and what's more, the claims are as varied as they are strange. In the summer of 2002, just outside Glasgow, an unnamed man took a picture from his window of a triangular-shaped craft. According to the witness, they were looking out of the window, trying to locate their cat when this strange thing in the sky caught their eye. He immediately grabbed his camera and snapped a shot. Within seconds, the craft was gone. More recently, on March 10th, 2009, a picture of a teapot lid-shaped UFO emerged following a sighting near Fife. The witness was taking photographs of the full moon at a little after 6pm. Although they didn't notice the object at the time, when going through the pictures later, they noticed a strange craft just to the left of the moon. They were stating their report, What amazes me is that there appears to be a lighter part on the object, the part nearest the moon. It is almost like the moon is reflecting off the underside of it. This, of course, would suggest that not only was the object solid and very real, but also that it was well within the planet's atmosphere. Without a doubt, though, the most active area of UFO Alley is around the Pennines, with Lancashire and Derbyshire having an abundance of sightings and reports. The absolute busiest area, however, is Yorkshire, 
which arguably has more sightings than most places in the United Kingdom. And what's more, it is not only UFO sightings that are seemingly rife in Yorkshire, there are also plenty of cases of alien abduction. And while we will examine some of these here, we will indeed return to this part of the United Kingdom in a future podcast to explore the area in depth. Perhaps one of the most disturbing encounters is the apparent alien abduction of Zygmunt Adamski. 56-year-old Zygmunt Adamski's dead body was found on top of a huge coal pile on June 16, 1980. He was over 20 miles away from his house in Tingley. The coal miner had been missing for five days after having leaving his home to visit the local shops. Upon initial investigation of his body, police noted how it appeared he had been lowered onto the pile of coal. If someone had dragged him up to his final resting position, there would have been coal markings and dust on his clothes, of which there was none at all. It also appeared as though he had been dead for some time, not least because he barely had a day's growth of beard upon his face. However, despite the coal yard being busy, no one had reported seeing his body, which police found unlikely if he had been there since he had gone missing. His face itself, described by one of the policemen sent to the call, PC Alan Godfrey, as being contorted with terror. The coroner also stated that Adamski must have known great fear or pain immediately before he died. More detailed investigation of Adamski's body found he had curious burn marks on the back of his neck, head and shoulders. A strange gel was also detected that detailed analysis could not identify. He was also found not to be wearing a t-shirt, only his trousers and jacket, both of which were fastened incorrectly, as if he had been redressed in a hurry. His shoes were also in such a state. All the clues were there to suggest some kind of strange intervention at the very least in Adamski's death. When the officer involved revealed he had witnessed a strange UFO encounter himself, then links became even stronger. Several months after the discovery of Adamski's body, PC Alan Godfrey claimed to have had his own alien abduction encounter. Godfrey, incidentally, has never wavered in his accounts despite facing much scepticism. In the book The World's Greatest UFO Mysteries, compiled by authors Nigel Blundell and Roger Bohr, they speak extensively of Godfrey's claims and the hypnotic regression sessions that followed. It became clear that Godfrey had reported to his superiors that he had seen what he believed to be a UFO only hours before Adamski's body was discovered in June 1980. The police did not name him publicly, but stated that someone had come forward and that UFO experts believed their account to be true. On November 28, 1980, Goddard made another report of a UFO. He claimed that the mystery object was floating about five feet above the ground in a Todd Morton housing estate at 5am in the morning. He claimed he had to wait until he got to the station to make the report due to his radio not working. UFO researchers soon picked up his case, discovering that Godfrey could not account for 15 minutes of time during his most recent sighting. Citing their source as a piece that appeared in the Sunday Mirror newspaper on September 27, 1981, the two aforementioned authors printed parts of his regression sessions. Godfrey told of how a blinding light had transported him from his car to the craft. He found himself in a medical white room, a tall six-foot figure with him, dressed in a dark suit and wearing a skull cap. Then, still under hypnosis, Godfrey became terrified. He would state the creatures were horrible and around three to four feet. He said they were touching him and feeling at his clothes. Even worse, they were robots and not human. We can make of those words what we will. Without a doubt, some of the most active UFO hotspots can be found in the United States. And while we will mention them briefly here, the activity is so detailed and numerous that each deserves an entire podcast episode in their own right, looking at their respective UFO encounters. Perhaps the best place to start would be on the west coast. If we start with the upper northwestern regions, both the states of Washington and Alaska are both locations where UFO reports are rife, with Alaska in particular also having multiple disappearances to its name, as well as many claims of alien abduction. If we head further south, California is another state that has more than its fair share of UFO sightings and encounters, 
and once more we can find many claims of alien abduction in the Golden State. There are other states where UFO activity is more rampant than average. Michigan, for example, has had numerous UFO encounters over the years, particularly around the Lake Michigan regions. Both Pennsylvania and Ohio also rank high in UFO reports, again around the regions near their Great Lakes. Indeed, as we have examined in previous podcasts, the locations near to large bodies of water could prove to be one of the common factors. There are also more specific locations, such as Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, the San Luis Valley in Colorado, and Hudson Valley in New York, all of which have been rife with UFO sightings for decades. And once more, each of these locations, as well as the states we have mentioned, will be subject to a podcast in their own right, such are the many intriguing and varied encounters. If we turn our attention to the Latin and South American continents, we can also find several UFO hotspots. Puerto Rico, for example, is arguably one of the busiest locations for UFO activity on the planet. Strange sightings and accounts in Puerto Rico date back to the 1950s. However, in the summer of 1987, UFO researcher George Martin began to speak with locals about intriguing events that were taking place, and with his investigations and interviews came some of the most detailed reports from the region. Martin, widely regarded as a credible UFO researcher, was even witness to some of these strange sightings himself. On May 30th, Residents local to Laguna Catagina witnessed a red ball coming out of the sky and breaking the waters of the lagoon. Witnesses would describe the event as controlled and not the random falling of a comet or meteor. Several hours later at 2am in the morning on May 31st, a huge silver disc was visible hovering over the same spot. As fascinating as the sightings were, later on in the afternoon the area suffered a powerful earth tremor. Perhaps of more interest, though, was the reports of underground explosions that seemed to come from the Laguna Catagina area. Local investigation would confirm the source of the tremor was indeed from under the lagoon at a depth of 13.5 nautical miles. However, less than a day later, the Puerto Rico Seismological Service overruled their findings, stating instead the epicentre was several miles out to sea. Events at the scene would suggest otherwise. Large fissures appeared in various places around nearby towns shortly after the explosion. From these sudden cracks in the ground, a cobalt-coloured smoke emerged. Perhaps even more suspicious was the military in anti-contamination suits from head to toe collecting samples from around the lagoon. The Laguna Catagina itself was cordoned off, with no access granted to anyone but limited military personnel. The following evening on June 1st, 1987, a large cylinder-shaped object was witnessed by many residents in the nearby communities. A strange fear was at each end of the object. According to witnesses, the craft hovered silently for around 15 minutes before speeding away to the south. On two separate occasions during the summer of 1988 came multiple reports of US military jets vanishing into huge triangular objects. Coincidentally or not, there appears to be increased activity in Salinas, where a US military base and the Puerto Rico Army National Guard Santiago base resides. Other reports would speak of strange objects flying through the air and then disappearing into the sides of mountains. One incident in November 1989 speaks of a hole emitting a brilliant reddish-orange illumination suddenly opening on a mountain between the two bases. Out of this doorway, a fleet of disc-shaped crafts emerged and became lost in the sky. As soon as the last craft left, the door shut as if it had never been there. All were visited by military personnel the following day. Each would inform that US authorities, the military and NASA were dealing with it. They didn't say what it was, only that it was real. Local fishermen would also see strange crafts entering and emerging from the waters of Laguna Catagena. Some would even describe seeing blue glows passing underneath their boats. Such was the speed and size of these blue glows, the water was disturbed on the surface. The strange events continued persistently, with many residents speaking openly about the alien base under the waters or hidden behind secret doors in the mountainsides. One resident would state to George Martin that something abnormal is going on down there. In August 1990, multiple people witnessed strange creatures walking down a quiet road near to the Laguna Catagena area. 
They were of varying height, between three and five feet tall, with large heads and big slanting eyes. One witness entered his car and followed them quietly. When he was a certain distance from them, they turned around and a brilliant light shone from their eyes, temporarily blinding him. He stopped his vehicle and managed to follow them on foot for a little while longer. They would jump over a small bridge and disappear into the woodland around the lagoon. The following day, however, the witness would receive a phone call from a man with an American accent. He was told directly and bluntly not to talk about what he saw or where the little men had walked to. The mystery voice continued, what is happening here is real and these beings must have a base or something underground in this area. In February 1991, former police officer Louis Torres and his wife Margarita witnessed several similar small creatures walking down a quiet road. They appeared to be talking to each other in gibberish, which sounded like a tape recorder on fast forward. The creatures walked straight past the pair and disappeared into the woodland near the road nearby. Several months later, in August 1991, local resident Swa Marisol Camacho awoke to see two strange creatures on her balcony. They were examining the plants she kept there. She would also describe hearing a fast-talking gibberish. An attempt to communicate with them appeared to scare them and they moved away with haste. She would state they returned in the night on several occasions, although she didn't interact with them after that. While Puerto Rico is perhaps the busiest in terms of UFO encounters, Brazil also boasts more than its fair share. And, like other locations we have examined here, we will return to explore some of the UFO encounters of Brazil in depth in a future podcast episode. We will, though, touch upon some of them here. Perhaps one of the most intriguing is arguably one of the earliest recorded such sightings in Brazilian history. According to the November 26, 1846 edition of the official Gazette of the Empire of Brazil newspaper, the strange encounter occurred on the Paraguay River in June of that year when a decorated member of the Brazilian Navy, Augusto La Verge, was on a military mission in the region. Their destination was the capital of Paraguay, in what was largely, and unofficially, a military muscle flexing exercise on the part of the Brazilian government. When they were just under 20 miles away, things began to turn strange. It was, according to the details recorded by La Verge, 5.57am when the phenomenon never seen before first occurred. The sky up until that point was clear and calm. However, out of nowhere, a luminous glow performed with instant speed a 30 degree curve in front of them. Apparently connected to this globe was a light band, along which three bodies were visible, whose brightness was much more lively. La Verge would offer that the object, including the three extra bodies, exceeded in intensity the full moon. La Verge would report that the three extra objects were separate from each other and of different shapes. He would describe one as circular, another as an arc of a circle, and the top object was irregular quadrangle. Furthermore, a ribbon of very faint light would move around the object in a zigzag motion. Perhaps the differing shapes was the object turning on its own axis as it travelled. This is a detail, albeit usually with disc or sphere-shaped craft, that is relatively common in UFO sightings. As they continued to watch the strange object, it would change shape again. This time it would appear to be a flat elliptical shape. After 25 minutes, the objects had disappeared into the distance, leaving not the slightest sign of any disturbance. La Verge wasn't alone in seeing the strange craft. As well as the crew of the boat, the Brazilian ambassador was also present. Furthermore, when they arrived at their destination a short time later, it was apparent that many had seen the strange incident from the city. Many people, including La Verge himself, pondered if the incident was some kind of atmospheric incident or even a meteor. However, the highly detailed description sits comfortably with contemporary descriptions of UFOs. Furthermore, the fact the object was visible for almost 30 minutes makes the meteor claims pretty much obsolete. Another country that is very much worth mentioning here is Chile, a country that is often referred to in UFO research circles as Alien Alley and yet another location we will undoubtedly return to in a future podcast episode. And it's perhaps interesting to note that much of Chile's terrain is miles and miles of uninhabited desert, valleys and vast woodland that is also home to largely unexplored cave systems. 
What is even more interesting, especially when we consider the legends, myths and creation stories of the region suggesting this UFO presence goes back thousands of years, is that this part of the world is abundant in raw materials. Materials that would be very useful for an advanced spacefaring civilization. In short, for the sheer volume of UFO and alien encounters to come from this part of the world, Chile perhaps flies under the radar for how important it might be in unveiling vital information regarding the UFO and alien question. Why are they coming there, and for how long and from where? Might the UFO sightings of the modern UFO era tell us why these apparent extraterrestrial visitors have seemingly held an interest in this part of the world, perhaps before even the beginning of known civilizations? There are other locations around the world where UFO reports are higher than usual. There are many UFO reports that come from in and around Pine Gap in Australia, a top secret facility that is a subject of multiple conspiracies, UFOs and otherwise. One of the most intriguing and thought provoking of which occurred in the late 1980s. While returning from an all night hunting trip at around 4.30am in the early hours of December 22nd 1989, three men would be witness to a surreal encounter. While roaming through land near to the Pine Gap facility, sudden activity in the grounds of the base would catch their attention. A camouflaged door suddenly opened before them, revealing lights and movement behind it. From inside this hidden enclosure, a metallic grey disc emerged. No sound accompanied its movements, and aside from their own breathing, all around them was silent. Suddenly, but still with little sound, the disc shot off at an amazing pace, certainly beyond anything any of the witnesses had ever seen. The door then calmly shut, hiding its presence once more in the process. The report would arrive with UFO researcher John Lear via a university professor. In it he mentions that all of the witnesses are reliable, though understandably rather reluctant to discuss what they had seen. He would also state, this state has more UFOs coming and going than anywhere else in Australia. Given the claims from some researchers that contact has already happened, might Pine Gap be one of the alleged alien human bases around the planet? Or might the disc-shaped craft that emerged from the hidden door be the result of military back-engineered technology? Investigations into the area would soon reveal plenty of similar sightings. One of the strangest incidents occurred in 1973. A cartographer working for the Australian government was parked near to the Pine Gap base. It was late, just after midnight. Out of nowhere, a strange but intense vertical shaft of blue light came from the confines of the base. Giving in to his curiosity, he drove his vehicle closer. He was shocked to see a disc-shaped craft hovering around a thousand feet in the air over the base. He raised his binoculars to his eyes. As he did, another blast of cold blue light emerged. It was coming from the centre of the craft and heading down to the domes of the base. After several moments, it went off. Then, a similar laser-like light extended from somewhere on the ground to the disc above. This went on for over 30 minutes before the disc began to spin rapidly. It then shot off into the night sky at great speed. Two years later, in 1975, a small private passenger plane was flying near the base. As most on board were already aware of Pine Gap, most would witness the large white object zoom into the air and vanish out of sight in a flash. Shortly after landing and making a report, officials would visit the pilots and the crew. They were told not to talk about what they had seen. Five years after that, in 1980, while searching for a missing child, two Northern Territory police officers would report a camouflaged door suddenly opening. Objects they would later describe as bathtub shaped left from this doorway and kind of made their way over the base. To their amazement, a black hole appeared in a hillside and each of the objects vanished into it. It is also worth mentioning the Bass Strait, that not only has rumours of UFOs on record, but has several strange disappearances to its name, perhaps not least that of Fred Valentich, who disappeared along with his plane in the late 1970s while claiming that a UFO was flying around his aircraft. One of the first recorded connections to UFO sightings here happened in 1920, when the SS Amelia J completely vanished in the Bass Strait. Strange lights had been noticed in the skies over the entrance of this stretch of water, and it is not hard to put the two things together. 
A full military search was conducted of the waters. However, in another twist, the search aircraft also vanished without a trace. In October 1935, after leaving Melbourne on its way to Tasmania over the Bass Strait, a private plane would suddenly go silent right before making its approach to land. Three passengers and two pilots would vanish also. Searches on this occasion would reveal small pieces of wreckage, but it brought more questions than answers. Three of the plane's chairs were discovered. They were twisted in a bizarre fashion, as was a portion of the petrol tank. Most puzzling was the discovery of a small piece of the plane's floor. On it was a charred patch, with evidence of localised fire that someone had tried to stamp out intensely. Nothing else of the plane or the passengers ever came to light. What might the reason be then that some locations around the world have significantly more UFO sightings than others? And might our ability to understand this allow us to understand the fuller UFO picture? What is, for example, the common factor that links these respective locations? Does the answer reside in our understanding of ley lines and possibly the existence of portals? Is there something in these locations that might be of specific interest to a spacefaring race? Or could the fact that the vast majority of these hotspots are located near water be of importance? And if this last possibility is the case, then does that lend further credence to the notion of underwater alien bases existing on Earth? Once more, we find ourselves in a situation where there are more questions than answers. For now though, I will simply thank you for joining me once again, and be sure to leave any thoughts in the comments, and check out the links for further reading on some of the cases and theories we have been discussing here. Remember to subscribe to our channel, and follow us on social media, to keep up to date on future podcasts, articles and videos, and if there is anything you want us to feature on future podcast episodes, then simply get in touch at marcus at ufoinsight.com. Until next time, goodbye and take care. Thank <music> you.